Okay, welcome everybody. Our, this is our continuing series on you know, eco-friendly um, actions with the landscape and lawn care. Uh, I'm Barry Draycott, the president of TechTerra Environmental. Uh, we, we do these educational things and, and also uh, help you understand some of the products that we have. Um, tonight's guest, we're honored to have Steve Retke from Rutgers. Steve has been a longtime friend and mentor. He's, he's uh, taught me a lot about IPM practices and things like that. So, uh, Steve, thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you, Barry. Always good to see you and to speak with your group again. And uh, yeah, my talk tonight, this evening, and welcome everyone who has decided to join us. And I'm gonna talk about some of these exotic invasive insect pests that New Jersey has been experiencing over the last, especially the last decade. We have had a whole host of them coming in. And so I wanted to kind of bring that in with a, another perspective, more of a uh, ecological balance and encouraging the planting of native plants uh, because even though the exotic invasives are going to be continuing and we got a new one, but it's not an insect, but it's the oak wilt disease that will be undoubtedly here within a year or two or so because it's at our doorsteps. And But I'm not going to talk about the diseases. I'm going to just kind of mention mostly insect pests. And we've had a, a couple real big ones the, the last uh, this century, uh, uh, you know, at least the, this new millennium, I should say since 2002, uh, the emerald ash borer came into the Detroit area. And it took about 12 years before it arrived in New Jersey as it moved toward the, toward the east. Took a little bit of time to get here, but of course it's been here now for uh, almost a decade. And uh, it's been killing uh, most of our, our ash trees, the Fraxinus. I'll talk about that in a little more detail. And then the other one that's just more recent, uh, it's been with us now, it'll be our fifth year. And that's, of course, the spotted lanternfly, which first arrived in the Berks County, Pennsylvania area in 2014. And so it didn't take that long, just four years for it to cross the Delaware. And now it has spread throughout the entire state of New Jersey and all 20, was it, uh, oh, how many counties do we have in New Jersey? 21, I think, 21 counties in New Jersey, and all of them are technically under quarantine and they have established populations of the spotted lanternfly. I just wanted to mention uh, the ones below the red line. We, of course, we have some other ones that uh, the recent name change from, I guess, a year ago or so, or maybe it's two years now, is the former AKA gypsy moth, which has now been changed to the spongy moth because uh, the gypsy name has uh, some negative uh, connotations to it. And so they thought it was the proper thing to do was to change the name which is very difficult for me to get used to because for almost 40 years calling it the gypsy moth, it's hard to make that change. But that first came into uh, Massachusetts in 1869. And that was uh, purposely introduced. Uh, and they think they were thinking that they could use it for uh, uh, producing uh, uh, silk and for, uh, and, and it, it got escaped. It was just in the Boston area, a little bit more north, but it took a long time. It took almost a century before it arrived in New Jersey, which it became established in uh, 1965. And I'll talk about spongy moth to a, a more limited degree. And then I just wanted to mention uh, New Jersey uh, and 1916 is where uh, in the Cherry Hill area, uh, not precisely in Cherry Hill, there's a town just at the Delaware, I forget the name of it, where the gypsy moth was. Yeah, uh, I think it was Riverton. It's about Riverton, 10 miles. you're right. Yes, that's right. 10 miles from me. <laughs> yeah, is that right, Barry? Okay. And so uh, I'm not going to talk about the gypsy moth. So, well, you know, that's actually one that's kind of been declining uh, the last number of years, at least in New Jersey. It's no longer the, the number one white uh, grub or scarab beetle. Now the oriental beetle has kind of taken its place. All right, so as far as uh, introducing these non-native uh, species, and sometimes we do introduce them purposely, and of course, many times though, they are accidentally brought in and they become a problem. Uh, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that something comes in as a non-native species that it makes them immediately invasive because uh, there are some that have become naturalized and they never were an ecological threat at all. So to be an invasive species, it does have to be ecologically harmful. And of course, the two ones, uh, 
such as the, uh, the, you know, the spongy moth obviously was uh, ecologically harmful and the spotted lanternfly and the emerald ash borer, they all have dramatically uh, disrupted the environment in uh, many areas of the, of the country. And then we also have naturalized species that are ecologically inclusive. And probably one of the better examples would be the European honeybee. And that of course is considered to be uh, you know, valuable. And there's another one that's kind of uh, maybe a little bit of both. And that was the multicolored Asian lady beetle. It was brought in purposely, uh, you know, again, from Asia and it was released in the Gulf state areas for, it was for peach trees for controlling uh, uh, aphids. And it worked really well. The problem was it migrated to the North and it started displacing and became uh, more aggressive than uh, many of our other species of uh, lady beetles. And so that has a negative impact. And, and it also can be a nuisance, especially if they get up into your attic. So that's kind of has a mixed bag to it. It has success in some areas, but becomes a problem in others. Okay. And so when we have native plants versus uh, native insect pests, we need to remember that native plants and native insect pests have co-evolved together for hundreds of thousands of years. And by means of a natural selection, they can each kind of, as a, I don't need to read this from here, but I, I will, uh, they kind of, they've learned to adapt to each of their survival defense mechanisms. And so there's kind of a give and take there. And what happens uh, ideally is you have a dynamic equilibrium that becomes established where the pest is no longer really that much of an ecological uh, negative impact because the, the maybe the, the, the plants have been able to combat it and uh, able to successfully uh, avoid uh, you know being infested and, and being killed by the, the invasive. And so you, we want to have this ecological balance ecosystem that, that will ensue. And that's the, that's the hope, but it always doesn't happen that way. And so just to remember that with native plants versus exotic insect pests, you know, the native plants have not co-evolved with exotic insect pests, and it may be more susceptible to attack. And I have an example of a number of our native trees that have very limited defensive defenses against these exotic uh, invasive pests. And uh, so native plants may not have developed any kind of specific defensive adaptations to combat these attacks from the exotic insect pests because they just did, they didn't co-evolve together. And so the, uh, the insect uh, pests, the exotics have an upper hand and it may take quite a long time you know, for natural selection to take place before the natives are able to uh, kind of fight back to a certain level, okay? But you know, plants, of course, do produce defensive chemicals, these secondary metabolites. And this is just an example of a handful of some, uh, for example, alkaloids is one that, uh, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the spotted lanternfly, obviously. And that's a type of, uh, it's very similar to, to nicotine. And uh, actually the spotted lanternfly likes alkaloids. And so plants like, uh, you know, red maples and, and also, uh, of course, the tree of heaven and, and tulip trees, those all have a lot of alkaloids in them. And, uh, you know, uh, and so therefore, uh, the spotted lanternflies are attracted to those trees for that reason. And their defenses that the plant produces has no negative impact on them. And uh, so and another thing is uh, I have their uh, tannins, there's some phenolic compounds. We're all familiar, again, also with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the spongy moth, I almost said gypsy moth, spongy moth. But the thing is, uh, oaks, one of their primary defensive chemicals are tannins. And so when a, when a spongy moth starts to feed on oaks, these defensive you know, metabolites has no real negative impact on them. They can successfully digest the food and and continue to feed on them and it doesn't harm them at all. And so uh, I what I wanted to do though, is kind of speak a little bit on that yellow one at the bottom, this physical mechanical defense mechanism. There's one that, uh, I mean, there's more than just birch trees that do this, but this is a great example of what's called wound paradigm. And uh, first of all, just to, I think all of us again are familiar with the bronze birch war. 
it's a native insect and uh, it can just tear completely tear apart the uh, European birches or the Asian birches. They have absolutely no defenses against the bronze birch borer. And so back in the 80s, when I kind of started with my landscaping career, uh, when I would go to these homeowner sites, they all had, uh, many of them had these Asian and European birches planted in their front yard in the front corner. And they usually lived maybe a decade if they were lucky because uh, the, the, uh, you know, the bronze birch borer would take them out. Those particular non-native birch trees had no defenses against our native bronze birch borer insect. I think I I've sprayed about a million birch trees in my career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But most of them I, died. I'm looking at one now, and it's a gray birch, and it's healthy, uh, but I also uh, keep it well watered and occasionally protect it with chemicals when I have to. But uh, anyway, the gray birch is a native birch. And we also have uh, you know, yellow birch and the paper birch. These are native birches, and they do have defenses against the bronze birch borer. They co-evolved with them. And so uh, we have, uh, this is an example, and maybe you've seen where you have a birch tree and at the top of the trees, you can see it starts to die back. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that's where the bronze birch borers are feeding because they will feed anywhere in a tree with uh, a twig or a branch about one inch or greater in diameter. But what happens if they are feeding and you start having what's known as just a hydraulic resistance, uh, perhaps some of the, the vascular conducting tissues, the xylem has been compromised and maybe lower down in the tree. And so the water can't get up higher. And so that's the upper canopy that starts to you know, die back because of simply a lack of water. But, you know, I always like to say that the wood borers are the true assassins of our landscape. And uh, that is very true. However, uh, our narrative birches, they do have a defense. And this is shown here where a pruning cut was made. And it was, uh, looks like it was uh, maybe a pretty good cut. It, it didn't remove the, the branch collar. And so therefore the, 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 branch, the tree was able to start to seal itself over. And they does this with what's known as wound paradigm. And so uh, that eventually, if it was, maybe maybe it takes a number of more years for this uh, this tree to completely seal over. But uh, so this is what they use, uh, the or birch trees. They use this wound peridum, but they use it in areas where the boar is tunneling and feeding. And so what they do is, as long as we don't have a drought problem and the trees are not under stress, these birch trees are able to produce these wound paradigm growths. And it's a type of like a gouty growth. And it can, what they do is they, as they, uh, as the, the larvae of the bronze birch warb starts to tunnel around, the tree responds and starts to encapsulate it with this wound paradigm and actually crushes it. They can't, the bronze birch borer cannot feed through the wound paradigm. It's just too hard for it. And uh, therefore, it just simply over time will crush it. And so that can be a very effective defense. And what you don't want, of course, when you start seeing uh, these D-shaped exit holes in the, the main trunk or the stem of a birch tree, that means that you kind of missed the boat and the tree is probably not going to live much longer. But this is what I'm talking about as far as the bronze birch borer resistance and the wound paradigm. This was research done uh, more than a couple decades ago at Ohio State University, and it was really an interesting research. And it, I don't know if it's well understood by many landscapers, so I thought it's important to kind of emphasize what this is all about. It is a graph, and so on the on the y-axis you have the tree percent trees that are infested. Now we're talking about our native birches, and they used uh, yellow birch and uh, and river birch and you know, gray birch and all the the primary native birch trees that we have. And what they determined was the at the x-axis, if you look at that, it says callus tissue growth per day. This is the wound paradigm, millimeters per day. So if the tree is healthy and growing vigorously, as long as it has the ability to produce at least, and it doesn't seem like it's not much, just 0 0.02 millimeters per day, of this gouty growth, this wound paradigm, it's able to be, have a pretty good resistance. And in most chances, 
it will be able to crush the larvae of the bronze burst borer as they try to feed and, and tunnel into the, you know, the vascular tissue. However, if it's, if it's a limited resistance and if it doesn't have that ability to produce 0 0.02 millimeters per day, per day, and we're not talking, that's not a whole lot. I mean, how many millimeters equals one inch? 25. And so this is a lot of, uh, and not a whole lot of uh, growth that it's, is able to be effective as, as a, a deterrent against the, the larvae of the bronze birch borer. So you can see as the, as the callus tissue growth gets less and yet less, uh, the percent trees that are infested becomes to the point where it's not effective anymore and it will take out our native birches. Okay. Steve, that, that's really interesting because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, through my career, the first part of the career for was on, you know, treating insects. And the second part of half of my career has been on learning how to grow healthier plants. Sure, sure. And uh, once I kind of got a handle on that, I was able to reduce a lot of the insecticides, not, you know, not completely. Sure get rid of them but yeah. you know it's it's like with people you you eat healthy yeah. you're going to resist a lot of things and same with plants Barry you probably have heard the term the acronym PHC or plant health care yeah my I've guess is you've heard it before okay <laughs> yeah you know I think IPM is a term that was initiated by entomologists uh, kind of going back to the 1950s and they were the early leaders of that particular type of pest management and uh, so uh, in some, some situations, maybe we've certainly moved beyond that. There's no question that we have. So it's a lot more than just, uh, you know, and the whole idea of keeping plants healthy is key. And, and also planting, uh, you know, trees that belong uh, yeah. at certain sites, no question. Okay, and so of course we, we, we do know the Heritage River birch, uh, highly resistant to bronze birch borer, you know, they're, they're uh, going back to that graph there, they're way out there to the right. They're probably up around, you know, 0 0.12 or, or even beyond that. Uh, they're able to produce this uh, wound paradigm very rapidly. And so that's why they have a, um, not completely an immunity because they can get stressed too and they can lose some of that ability to produce the wound paradigm. But normally if they're at least fairly healthy, they have that uh, great advantage. and. Uh, so usually the bronze birch borer doesn't even look at these trees, the, yeah. the river birch as a potential host because they, uh, they realize they're not going to be successful feeding in them. Okay. How about leaf miners? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as river birch, uh, leaf miners are, uh, there's, a, there's a decent resistance to it. They will feed in them, and I've seen them. They'll make the mines, but they don't seem, the, the birch leaf miner larvae don't seem to have the ability to complete their life cycles. Mm -hmm. And so they'll drop out of the leaf before they've, uh, you know, pupated. And the leaves are marginally uh, damaged, but it's nothing as severe as with, uh, you know, the other native birches, but uh, they don't have much of resistance to them, uh, the, bron the uh, birch leaf miner. And so, yeah, but the river birch does. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know what the mechanism. What? What's the? Obviously, there's a chemical involved, and I don't know what it is, Barry. But uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I know. I think we all know this. Uh, it's rarely is there a silver bullet, of course, and a native plants will promote ecological balance and biodiversity, which is ideally what we are looking for. However, the native plants may be more susceptible to adverse attacks by exotic invasive insects. And again, it's the fact that they, they usually never had the chance to develop any kind of defensive mechanisms against them. And so uh, that's why we oftentimes, when, when we get an invasive coming in from an, another part of the world, uh, oftentimes it seems more likely than not to be from Asia, but uh, you know they will bring in the, some of the beneficials from that part of the of the world that had co-evolved with a particular uh, uh, invasive insect pest, and it's able to uh, if we're able to establish it here, and that's what we're attempting to do uh, with some of our things like the spotted lanternfly and also the emerald ash borer, which unfortunately is going to be really kind of too late for that one. But this is kind of a busy a busy slide. There's a lot of information here, but just to kind of make it uh, simplified a bit. I, what I have here are seven native birches, not native uh, trees. 
okay? I used green ash twice, as you can see. And I divide them up on the left and the right. On the left, we have exotic invasive insects and attacking our native birches. And then on the, on the right, we have our native trees being attacked by our native insects, okay? And so there's a difference. And I just kind of randomly chose these and, I, and I'm sure I could bring up many other examples but uh, just for example, uh, with, the, with the ones that uh, on the left with the exotic invasive insects, more often than not, you'll see next to the I for invasive, you'll see the plus sign, which means it's a tree killer. Uh, and then with the native, oftentimes, uh, not always, but you'll have uh, next to the, the N for native, you'll have the zero, which means not a tree killer. And so you can see the difference between the two there. Uh, you know, the green ash has virtually no, no resistance to the emerald ash borer. They do not have a chance. Uh, I'll have a, more information on that later, later on. Same thing with the uh, Eastern hemlock against our hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, if we let the adelgid just run amok, it's run its course without any intervention. It will eventually kill the eastern hemlock, and which it has certainly done over the last several decades. And the white oak with the spongy moth, even though I may not necessarily directly kill the oak trees, certainly you have maybe two or certainly three consecutive years of 75% or more of defoliation. The oaks are severely stressed. And then the, uh, the borers come in, uh, you know, the two-line chestnut borer. And, and maybe some diseases as well. So uh, now I did want to put one down there, the red maple with the spotted lanternfly at the bottom left. It is an invasive, of course, but as far as it's not a tree killer, in fact, the spotted lanternfly has really been known to only kill the tree of heaven and, the, and also our grapes, grapevines. They will kill both of those. However, uh, maybe I had put, put a question mark because, you know, when the feeding gets really extensive, the tree becomes so weakened that something else will come in and, and take it out. So, but directly, it, it definitely doesn't necessarily kill the red maple. At least that's not what we've seen thus far. Okay. And the, kind of the same thing over on the right with our, our native trees versus our native insects. Uh, you can see that's just they're more able to kind of fight back. And uh, and there's not always every every always the case. I go right down to the the bottom just to save time. The American arborvitae. Have you ever seen bagworm caterpillars on them? They have no defense against the bagworm caterpillars. And when they become defoliated, uh, the, the the tree is almost always dead. You know, you have conifers that store a lot of their reserved carbohydrates in the foliage. You know, from the last few years. And with, which is the big difference then say when bagworms feed on our deciduous trees, because oftentimes we have reserved carbohydrates in the, in, the, in the branches or in the roots. And so they can become defoliated and those trees can often recover. But the American arborvitae or any kind of spruce tree or uh, you know, Leyland cypress or you know, junipers, they, when they become defoliated by bagworms, they're usually almost always will be killed. All right, and so let's get to the one of our first exotics we'll mention. And I, I have a feeling that most of you are already very familiar with this. So perhaps I can speed things up a bit. When you see this has happened to be right in my, my porch in the back. In fact, I can look right out and see where I took the photograph. There was a spotted lantern fly with its wings open, which means that it was almost dead because it had become paralyzed and it had lost its ability to control its wings. And so they spring open and they expose that nice scarlet red coloration there with their hind wings. They uh, also, beautiful. did I step on this? <laughs> yeah, well, they're kind of pretty. They're a big, big insect too, about an inch. Did I step on it? No, I didn't step. <laughs> you know, I, maybe this is kind of an editorial on my part and it's subjective. But I know there's a lot of emphasis done with the spotter lantern flies to stomp it out, you know, maybe get your revenge and, and have, you know, hopefully you think a meaningful impact. You're not having a meaningful impact. There's just too many of these insects. And I guess it makes people feel good. And so, yeah, but yeah. A, a yeah. Couple, couple of years ago, one of the landscape uh, 
um, um, associations in New Jersey had their outdoor um, summer exposition and everything. And yeah. the lantern flies are like crazy. And, and it was like, <laughs> it was a stomping contest. <laughs> you know, and I think it's, uh... What happens, I think, is a negative impact on children was that they figure they, children begin to fear insects, which they really probably shouldn't. I mean, there's certainly some insects you need to be wary of, but you know, to fear insects and to think that they all need to be killed, I, I think, is uh, doing a disfavor. Uh, so that's kind of an editorial on my part. So anyway, so this this is a spotter lanternfly, gravid female, and and they start. To, laying eggs in late September, and they can lay them technically all the way until December, although the vast majority of eggs by the spotter lantern flies are being done uh, in October, or maybe especially the second last two weeks of October. And you'll see that yellow swollen abdomen, you know, it's a female. They're slightly larger than males, and you can see them in the later eggs. And uh, this is a photograph I took, uh, and you, Kind of maybe you're not expecting to see the one on the left, which is a freshly laid spotter lantern fly. It only has that white color for just a matter of probably less than a dozen hours. And it changes to that more gray color that blends in very nicely with a lot of the bark oftentimes. But uh, so that's that first laid. Uh, in fact, when the, when the uh, uh, adult uh, spotter lantern fly you know, actually, it's not the adult. It's the uh, the first instar spotter lanternfly. When they hatch out, they're actually kind of a white color themselves, but they they become black with the uh, jet black coloration with the white spots again within a matter of hours. And so we often don't notice it. I just happened to be lucky to catch this this egg mass, which probably had been laid within the last hour or two. That has a nice polar white color to it, and it fades very quickly. Though. And then, of course, uh, this is where the, the eggs are hatching, an uh, eighth of an inch or so. People might think not familiar with them. They might think they're ticks. Uh, but uh, you see the vacated egg masses. There's a couple of them there. And what is there, about 30 to 50 eggs per mass. And so they come out. And they move rather well. Uh, they move up and down. They they move off the plants many times. This was a gray bird that so they, the eggs were were being hatched from. And they didn't stay on the gray birds, they left. Uh, in fact, I, I took this photograph at my one of my relatives who lives in Birch County. And I, and I, this is early on, this was back 2016, and I was still learning about this insect. And I said to him, you sprayed for them, didn't you? He says, no, I didn't spray. Well, they're gone now. And yeah, they left the tree and they, they started feeding uh, on herbaceous plants and even on grasses and weeds. Uh, but uh, they can't feed on, uh, on on bark yet at this stage. In fact, the first three instars, they don't feed in bark because they don't have, a, their beak is not stout, their proboscis is not stout enough to penetrate the bark. So they have to feed on salt, the leaf tissues. So, uh, so controlling them, um, you don't really need a systemic, do you? Well, you can use contacts, Barry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm going to talk about that. Okay. I'm going to get into the chemicals and other control methods as well. But, uh, you know, they do have uh, four immature instars, one through four, and then they have the adult stage. They don't pupate, so they have an incomplete or partial metamorphosis. But these are the third and the fourth instars, and they, they start about an eighth of an inch and then. Uh oh. What happened? <laughs> I think we lost him. Maybe give him a second to try to get back on. You think it was the spotted lantern flies? <laughs> <laughs> they, they're listening. They've done him in. <laughs> they, they've cut the wires outside. <laughs> they knew it. They knew it. <laughs> oh, he should have stepped on him. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Tell him to get back in. Yeah. Texting so, him now. Yeah, maybe text him the link. Oh. Anybody have any questions? It's a good time to type them in the chat. <laughs> Good 
Come on, attendees, help us out. Yes, yeah, somebody put on some music. <laughs> I don't have spotted lanternflies up here yet. I'm in New Hampshire. Yeah, we have them. We have right. Japanese beetles, though. Lots of them. Yeah. Back in. Let's wait. 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 What is that? I can't even hear. I beg your pardon. Say that she's new, but that big thing just to figure out the I couldn't think of an insect appropriate. You know, regenerative agriculture. We don't have our song yet for regenerative agriculture. Any luck getting a hold of Stephen? Texting him right now. Okay. Does he even know that he's dropped off? I don't know. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he's, still giving, he's still giving his presentation. He might have his phone off so that it doesn't, uh, <laughs> you know, make any, I have mine turned. I mean, I have the sound turned off anyways. We could plug organic land care standards while we're waiting here and- Oh, Rachel, I love to do this. <laughs> I live for these moments, guys. I really, really do. <laughs> I really well, yeah, do. Rachel basically wants to tell everybody that uh, NOFA has organic land care standards and they exist. And there's training based on that, so. Exactly. If you, want to know, that. if you want to know, it took me so long at the farmer's market. Uh, yeah, that would be why. And 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 the master gardeners were tabling again. So I got all my, you know, you guys don't know this. The master gardeners are a huge resource for anywhere you go with the extension office for soil samples and native plant information. And these guys just, they're so on it. I just, I want to salute them. They're so good. That's and I, yeah, and there's a huge wait list to get into our master gardener training program in Austin. So um, I'm just trying to leave back in. Yeah, there we go. All right. So give him a second to get situated. There's Steve. Hi, Steve. You're muted. You're still muted. Oh, let me. Uh, no. You should be able to. There you go. No, I had a I had a shutdown. So uh, let me. Um, what did this spotted lantern fly fly in or something? <sighs> No, the, the computer shut down. It was a thermal. Oh no! Thermal breakdown. So, let's see if I can. Oh. There you go. That's your uh, launch meeting for Zoom. Okay. Slides yet? There am, you I, are. am I okay? Um, you got to make it full screen, but you got your slide I'm up. About to do that, yeah. Perfect. Okay. We're back up here. Sorry about that. It's okay. Hope, hope we didn't lose too many people. <laughs> yeah, it just suddenly that's never happened before uh, with this computer. It just had a thermal. I I had it on a book uh, to kind of elevate it, so I took that book away. So maybe that'll prevent it from overheating. It might perhaps it blocked the vents. I'm I'm not sure. So anyway, okay. So these are the typical host plants. The uh, plants that, uh, that the spotted lanternfly will feed on. Tree of heaven, obviously number one, it will kill it. Potentially at least smaller trees, younger trees with heavy infestations and grapes as well shown there uh, a little bit further down. Those are the only two trees that will can directly kill. Now the, all the one, other ones they can uh, you know, feed on pretty heavily but not been known to kill any of them. And so there's a whole host of them. As far as the total number of um, plants. I mean, I'm including both or woody ornamentals as also herbaceous plants. The last count I heard was something like 175 plants 
that they've been known to feed on. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the greatest, without doubt, the greatest economic concern are the grapes. And to a lesser degree, some of the other fruit uh, trees shown there, the hops and the apples. But uh, compared to the grapes, uh, that is by far the worst as far as economic losses. Um, and they're made primarily in residential areas. They're predominantly a major nuisance. And they're not known to necessarily kill too many trees. If they kill a tree of heaven, we don't necessarily be too concerned about that. Right. But they usually only kill the younger ones. As far as conifers, my understanding is they will not feed on conifers. They will lay eggs on conifers, but they will not. They don't, they don't really feed on them. Okay. Steve, right. do we know how many parts of the country we have this problem, or is it the whole country? Ah, uh, spotted lantern flies. Now, the last I heard, they are in dozen states that have been established, a dozen states. Okay, as far, I've, I know, I just heard they're now definitely in Massachusetts and up in New England, and they have also been spotted in New Hampshire, uh, but not only in the southern part. One of the problems with the uh, spotted lanternfly is that as far as they can't tolerate a lot of cold temperatures, only because they can't tolerate cold temperatures themselves. They can overwinter in very cold temperatures as eggs, but uh, they do require a long growth period. They have a long life cycle and they can start hatching out, uh, you know, sometime uh, they're, that they're hatching now and in, in May, mid-May, all the way until uh, they can live until potentially uh, you know, the end of November or even early December. So that's a very long life cycle. And it takes a lot of time for them to be able to, you know, complete that, complete that uh, extended life cycle. And so when it gets a little bit too cool early on, it, and it doesn't warm up until later in the spring, and it, it cools down pretty earlier in the fall, they're not having enough time for them to complete their life cycles. And so they're going to be limited to how far north they can go. But uh, yeah, I think the last I heard is a, a dozen states and they're out, uh, you know, they're they're moving through Ohio and Indiana. I think they are in Indiana now. They're in, I think I've heard them enter uh, into um, in Michigan as well, and uh, and Tennessee, uh, uh, Kentucky. I'm not sure about Tennessee. Kentucky, yes. Uh, Virginia, yes. And uh, I'm not so sure about North Carolina. They're right at the doorstep of North Carolina. But uh, I don't have the slide uh, a photograph with me showing you the. Uh, the amount of tree of heaven that are grown throughout the United States. Now that tree of heaven, which is an invasive as shown here, and it was purposely brought into this country um, and it's from Asia and so from China and different other countries in, in Asia. And they planted it purposely in, um, in, in Philadelphia. <laughs> in the 1780s, they thought it'd be a great shade tree. It's very stress tolerant, which it is, and it grows very fast, which it certainly does. And it can provide some shade, but they didn't realize what a tremendous nuisance it can be. And uh, so, um, yeah, this, this is showing you a photograph of, of a clone of Tree of Heaven growing uh, probably like a 75 foot strip. I know this site very well because of the YMCA that I, I've been a member of for 25 years. Initially that you can maybe see a goalie or maybe a, a batting cage uh, area toward the left. That used to be all woods. And, uh, and when they built the YMCA, the parking lot, they disturbed that border area uh, and kind of elevated the land a little bit as you might be able to notice in the photograph. And then it was ideal site for trees of heaven to start to grow. And, and the initial one, uh, I think the parent tree is just a little bit left of the stop sign. You see the back of the stop sign. And uh, they're all clones. And so that means, uh, and I know this, uh, these are all, all males, all male tree of heaven. And which is uh, probably a good thing because they don't produce seeds. Uh, but uh, this has been growing there for just not more than, I don't know, less than 20 years, maybe 15 years, I started noticing them and they've gotten up to pretty good size and they continue to spread further to the, uh, to the right there. Yeah. I have, I have a friend who's involved with, uh, you know, clearing the right away for yeah, high, yeah. high tension power lines. And this is just horrible for them. <laughs> yeah. The, the parent tree there, which could probably have roots extending, they say up to maybe 50 feet and you can have these, uh, 
these root suckers that can sprout new, uh, you know, trees that are, are all clones. And so it's genetically identical. And that's just how this, this whole spread uh, occurred there. All right. Steve, is it possible to use like a copper guy wire and, and like just let it grow into that and wreck it from the cambium layer? And if you know, you yeah, I, I understand that, you know, copper can be toxic. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone doing that. If it, I'm sure it's been attempted, but I'm not aware of the, of the results of that. But that would be I'm cool. not suggesting that I've tried this before in my youth with okay. plants, right. but it is something. And other plants respond, like if you're trying to get rid of something, sometimes nails, like, but copper ones. So like, you know. yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of any research on that. Well, so. I'm just saying maybe you want to do a little side research over by the, uh, in that little strip right there to see how that works out. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll make that recommendation to the, uh, Rutgers people. <laughs> so, all right. So this is obviously a, a large population of spider lantern flies all gathered. Uh, they often will be seem to be attracted to trees under higher turgor pressure. You know, even though they, they have a pretty powerful beak and they can feed in bark and the fourth instar and as adults, they don't have a strong uh, suction capability. And so they really do prefer trees that have uh, you know, good turgor pressure to them, sap pressure. And I understand just more recently research too, they also have a visual aggregation uh, attraction. And so they'll see a lot of their, their, their buddies, you know, feeding on a tree. And so they'll fly and go to that tree. I must be a good tree to feed on. And so they do have this, seem to have this uh, visual aggregation that they, they're using. But the adults who are active from July, they start to, you know, changing from that fourth instar into the adults, usually toward the end of the second half of July, depends upon how, how warm it's been and how far south you are, but they can last all the way through November and even in December. But I just happened to mention here that severe sap pressure depletion can weaken and stress the trees. And so there have been on occasions where the tree of heavens have been you know, sufficiently fed upon year after year after year, or will kill them. Well, here's the female uh, with that uh, about an inch in size, and look at the size of that beak. It's about a half inch. It extends maybe halfway across its body. Fortunately, they don't use that beak to uh, you know puncture animals with. Although I I have told people have told me that they have been uh, punctured with it. I don't really believe them. But that's what they say. So I'm not going to call them liars, but uh, it seems unlikely it might be something different. So, but you know, these adults, I mean, they can they can easily penetrate the bark of woody plants pretty well and pretty evenly. And as as they say, feed they really suck up a lot of the sap. You know, you know those those insects like aphids and and some soft scales and you know plant bugs as these are. I should emphasize that. Uh, 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 spotted lanternfly is a is a plant hopper, and uh, and so for any of these sucking type insects that are feeding in the phloem, they're primarily feeding in phloem. They have to suck up a lot of it to get a sufficient levels of protein. It's loaded. The sap is loaded with carbohydrates, but they can only use so much of that. Yeah, it's good quick energy for them, but when they have plenty of energy, they also need protein for reproduction purposes and for you know cell development and laying eggs and that kind of thing. So they really do have to suck up a lot of sap to get the sufficient levels of, of protein. And then they give off all this, this sugary, shiny honeydew, this sticky stuff, and then that black sooty mold, which is a it's a fungus and it's ubiquitous. It's found everywhere. It's not not a plant pathogen, but if it does cover the foliage sufficiently level, uh, sufficiently enough, it can block photosynthesis and uh, the trees can, uh, in some cases, especially, well, certain branches can be killed. And if it's a small tree and it's loaded with this black sooty mold as blocking sunlight, it can kill, it can kill uh, underlying smaller trees pretty, uh, without too much problem. And so, and then uh, you can see there where it's uh, you know, killing all the weeds and the grasses where it had a couple of uh, tree of heaven feeding and it'll probably be killing more and more of these, uh, these vines that are growing underneath. And so uh, it can kind of actually kind of be a, a weed control in some respects. And I didn't uh, mention if I can, I shouldn't go back, but real quick, uh, 
this area here. Uh, last year, I really got a good population. All this underbrush here completely killed and it was totally vacated of weeds. And uh, so it was a, it was a good uh, type of an herbicide, uh, but it's already growing back. And so it'll probably do it again though. And so what happens with Tree of Heaven though, and it seems to only happen to the, that species Tree of Heaven, when they are really feeding at high levels, uh, what can occur is you get a, a fermentation taking place or it's a white fungal mat that begins to grow. And it's usually gonna be at the base of the tree and it can begin to uh, penetrate into the vascular tissue and begin to block and act as a uh, as more of a, like a wilt. And uh, so therefore, if it girdles it completely, which is maybe difficult for this, this, uh, this fermentation, this white fungal mat to do, but if it does girdle a tree and it, it plugs up all the vascular tissue, then it, it does have that ability to kill the plant. But it kind of smells like, uh, like vinegar. <laughs> I've seen that on occasion. And you see all the black sooty mold that's listed there too. And I have mentioned the fact that they will kill uh, grapevines. And that's the primary, that's really the biggest economic problem with agriculture. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna mention one thing that uh, I think all of us probably realize, and I keep saying that too, too often, but uh, the, the neonicotinoids where we discussed before we even came on, uh, they're being eliminated from the resident, New Jersey residential landscapes. Uh, but in agriculture, they can continue to use the neonicotinoids and grapevine uh, grape growers do use a great deal of the neonicotinoids to keep these uh, grapes from being killed by the, by the spotter lanternfly. There's other materials, no doubt that they could use, but uh, I guess this, this, the neonicotinoids has, has worked well for them, and so they a lot of them do use it. Stephen, um, how do the spotted lanternflies respond to the black sooty mold? Are they grossed out by it? Would it like if I sprayed, if I conjured some black sooty mold and sprayed that on a tree <laughs> on her knee? Well, well, you know, when they're the adult stage, uh, they're not feeding on leaves so much anymore. The feeding on the woody tissue. And even though the black sooty mold can, you know, cake the, the bark, they're able to penetrate that. And so I don't know if it's, uh, it's an irritant to them. I, I my suspicion is it is not. I've certainly seen uh, the adults, you know, moving around on the bark that's loaded with the black sooty mold. So I would say that does not have any kind of a deterrence to it. Yeah. You know. All right. And so there's some good non-chemical suppressions and that uh, emphasized suppression. It's kind of like, you know, stomping things out and maybe eliminating a, a certain percentage of them, but it's not gonna really uh, totally, you know, certainly not gonna come anywhere near eradicating them. Even chemicals don't do that necessarily, but this is a, uh, you know, circle trap. That's, uh, it's, you know, really, it's uh, an improvement upon the older, uh, uh, sticky traps they used to wrap around the trunks of the trees and they would catch all kinds of things you don't necessarily want them to like wildlife you know birds and and even small mammals perhaps and so this is an improvement on that uh, and it's uh they use the uh, this type of a device that uses the behavior of the spotter lanternfly against them and so as they climb the trees and they climb up and down the trees and so they can climb down okay, but when they want to start climbing back up again, they will get kind of funneled into this netting and they move in further and further. They just, they just that's their behavior to continue to climb higher and higher. Then they drop into this plastic bag that's at the end. And you would want to, you know, probably want to change that every uh, week or two or three, depends upon how many you're catching. And so for their, I don't know percentage wise, how many uh, you're actually controlling. But, um, you know, it's maybe it's a, a mild control uh, impact, but it's just kind of using the behavior, this climbing behavior of, of mostly the adults and also some of the nymphs, especially the fourth end star nymph. But the, all, the, all the nymph stages will climb trees. And so you can catch them through this, this type of, of method, okay? And these are some of the, the chemical controls and the ones I have with check marks that would be considered to be more bio-rational or 
I don't know if EPA necessarily caused them reduced risk. I, I know neem oil is a do reduced risk. I don't know. I'm not actually sure if polycultural oil and insecticidal soaps are by EPA considered to be reduced risk, but they are biorational. And so these are all contact materials. And if you do make good contact with the, you know, the spotter lantern fly, you will kill them. However, uh, you know, they, they don't persist. There's no residual to these materials once they dry, which is usually within an hour or so, depends upon the humidity. Uh, they no longer have any, uh, you know, efficacious capabilities. So they have to be done like multiple times. But uh, we have some of these other ones. Uh, the neonignanoids has been kind of the use product of choice and Safari in particular, which is Dinotefron. But uh, as far as New Jersey residential landscapes, that has been eliminated. And it's because of the concerns and problems with these neonignanoids provide with our, 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 our cause to our pollinators. And uh, I made a comment uh, again before we all came on that uh, neonicotinoids have sometimes been called by entomologists as being the food altering drug for the mood altering bug. <laughs> Let me see if I can get this right. The mood altering drug for bugs <laughs> because it doesn't necessarily kill them if they get the neonicotinoids in them, but it causes behavior disruptions and uh, it creates problems for them. And so communication and orientation and, and that kind of thing. And uh, so then we have these contacts that will work well as long as, and it gives you some residual as well. Uh, pyrethroids, they are not biorational by any means and they are kind of bug killers and they're, they're, they're broad spectrum in their capabilities and they last on bark maybe three weeks. So if you can spray the trunks of the trees as they climb up and down, as high as you're able to you, you uh, reach with your spray spray uh, tank or gun, uh, you can get you know a few weeks control with the pyrethroids, and then uh, seven and orthine are some of the old uh, carbamates and organophosphates that are still around, and uh, I would assume within not too many years in the future they will undoubtedly probably kind of be restricted use as well but at the moment uh, you can still be using them and they all work as contacts. Uh, spotter lantern flies are not difficult to kill with most chemicals. I mean, neem oil is really pretty you know, mild material. It's not a dynamic insecticide, but it can kill them. And so it all depends upon your coverage. That's the key thing with the oils and the soaps. And so there's another one I've mentioned, you got dormant oils. And there's a particular brand name and there's other brand names as well, but one is called the golden oil. And you'd use this uh, against the egg masses kind of late in the season uh, after they've overwintered. And this is uh, showing you an egg mass that I think I may have taken this photograph sometime in early April. And you notice how the egg mass is kind of split open and breaking apart and the eggs are being exposed and the eggs are just one layer. And they're they're laid in about often seven rows and perhaps uh, or five five to seven rows and maybe seven uh, like a string of beads maybe seven high or so so you can have you know anywhere from thirty to fifty eggs all in a single flat file that then the female will use a type of a protein with a waxy type protein that they use to cover up the eggs to protect them for the winter but as you have uh, the, the cold temperatures, the freeze thaw cycles that comes into place, that, that waxy protein starts to split open, like I said. And then you can use this oil and apply them in kind of late in the, late in the winter or, or very early in the spring, but you have to go pretty high with your percentage, four to 5%. Now, normally a dormant oil, you max out around 3%. And so you gotta be careful you know, I'm spraying leaves, and so that's that's helpful. But uh, you know, even four to five percent, I'd be somewhat cautious on certain plants of where you can apply this and have it work. How, what type of uh, efficacy does this provide? And I think the research is still out on that. So I think uh, last year, Penn State University did some research. I forget the uh, efficacy percentages that they that they've listed, but it was pretty significant. So this is one though that, uh, you know, the thing is that these eggs, if it's a big tree, 90, 85 to 90% of the eggs are 10 feet and above, 
you know, the ground. And so this is another thing where, you know, people say you got to scrape the egg masses off. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, but to remember that, you know, maybe 90% of them are up higher on the tree. You're not going to, unless you're going to climb the tree, you're not going to get those. So a lot of this stuff is just making you feel good. But uh, anyway, all right, that's uh, one possibility. And I know Barry started talking about this a little bit as far as herbicide uses. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, and there's two materials that are used a lot. Uh, one is... Uh, called glyphosate you can just use, which is Roundup, right? Uh, it's under, you know, kind of a controversial material now also. Um, and, um, but that has shown to be pretty effective. You can spray the, uh, the foliage with that. And another material is called triclopyr, which you'd want to do is maybe make more of a, uh, a trunk treatment or what's called a hack, uh, a, a hacking type. Uh, gee, I just, I wrote a blog on it. I just have to get what it's called. Uh, do you, can you help me, Barry, with that? Hack and uh, it's a hacking thing. You, know, you make a split in the bark and you spray the triclopyr and the openings that you split open. But anyway, um, that that is important to do that before you cut the tree down, all right? With the tendency to spray the herbicides first or cut the tree and then put down the, the herbicide. With Tree of Heaven, it's not gonna be very successful because of the fact that they have all these root suckers and it extends out, you know, 40, 50 feet. And, it, and if you kill the tree, you're not gonna have translocation with the herbicide to the more distant roots. And so you have a lot of root suckering taking place. Maybe you'll, you'll kill the, the, the trunk sprouts that might, uh, right next to the trunk itself, the tree that's cut. What you wanna do is do these uh, materials and uh, the trunk treatments, uh, before you cut down and wait at least 30 days, uh, allow that translocation to, to move. And, and, and it's best to do it uh, maybe sometime in late July all the way to uh, maybe about mid-October is when you'll get your best translocation. And I think many of us know when you're using even Roundup, uh, if you're gonna control weeds, your most effective time of the year to apply that is in the fall is when all the photosynthates and the movement is moving down to the roots and you can get the, uh, the herbicide uh, toxin to the roots and kill the roots more successfully. So just to, don't make that mistake of cutting the tree down and then maybe, oh, I can apply the herbicide. With some tree species, yes, you can do that, but not with the tree of heaven. You gotta apply the herbicide first, wait 30 days, at least 30 days, and then you can cut it down and then do it from July to about October is the best results. And there are certainly a lot of uh, you know beneficials out there, and you know things like green lace wings and assassin bugs and praying mantids and barn spiders and predaceous stink bugs, but uh, they're just overwhelmed. They cannot. They're most of these insect predators are, even though they're very good predators, they are uh, kind of solitary, and they're just overwhelmed by the numbers that they are you know trying to uh, to feed upon, and so uh, you can't really rely on our on our uh, or solitary predators that are outstanding, but uh, can't do the job against the spotted lanternfly. Now that the research is where this is really starting to be the thing, and maybe eventually we will have this. Uh, many of our land grant universities who are now experiencing spotted lanternfly problems, they are working with you know their beneficial insectary labs. You know Trenton, we have our beneficial insectary lab, and I know at Trenton they're working. They're using three of these uh, these parasitoids. Uh, Anastatus orientalis, uh, Oenchritis cuvanae, and also uh, Dryanus sinicus. And uh, the first two at the top, those are egg parasitoids. They're going to be, you know, laying eggs within the eggs of the spotted lanternfly and feeding on them and killing the eggs. And then the other one, the Dryanus, the Dryanicus uh, uh, sinicus, is a nymph parasitoid, probably first instar uh, nymph as they first hatch out. And so you can see uh, in the egg mass shown there, if they are circular, as the arrow indicates, that means that it was the emergence hole of a parasitoid wasp. So they were in this egg and they killed the, the, you know, the embryo of the egg, and then they pupated and they emerged and they cut a circular hole. Now, when they're elliptical as shown there, um, I hope you, can, you can see my cursor, right? Yep. Okay, that's that just shows you where the uh, where the uh, 
emerged spotter lanternfly nymph came out, that first instar nymph. And so the re early research indicates maybe 30, 40% with a question mark of the egg masses are parasitized successfully. And of course that, you know, that's probably about the best you can expect. That's, that's what the early research is indicating. So that is still significant, but it's certainly not gonna eliminate them. But you know, maybe if you have other, other predators coming into play, and maybe also, perhaps, if you're stomping around and, and killing a lot, that that's, has a minor impact, but that can also, you know, at least be a contributor. But, uh, and we have other things like the intimal pathogenic fungi infecting the spotted lanternfly. The Bovaria bassiana is a naturally occurring fungus pathogen that has been shown to kill the, uh, the spotted lanternfly. And then uh, the one that's best known for uh, killing gypsy moths, or uh, I say I did it, the spongy moth is the Entomophica maimaiga species, and that has decimated the uh, the spongy moth. But it also can work against the sp uh, the spongy moth caterpillar, and so uh, and so uh, that I mean I'm sorry that works against spongy moth caterpillar, but it can also work against the uh, the, uh, you know, the spotted lanternfly. So I get my insects confused. And there's one fernal further one this. Uh, Batcoa major, which is an intimal pathogenic fungi, kind of similar to the, uh, the Bovaria. So these all kind of work together as well. And so we have enough of these, perhaps it can make more and more of an impact. However, this is what we're up against with these spotted lanternfly populations. Look at that. It says 93 to 97% mortality per generation is required to successfully control a high density population. We are not anywhere near that. You know, I don't care how much stomping you're doing out there or egg scraping. We're not going to get anywhere near 93, 97%. And so therefore, what this really means, at least for now, is that biocontrols may only achieve suppression and not eradication. That's more than likely what we're going to have to, you know, accept that's going to be the case. And then reaching and establishing biocontrols takes time usually a decade or more. And I mentioned those three parasitoids that are under quarantine now and the Trenton you know, beneficial insectary, they're determining what are the negative side potential side effects. And is it really gonna be an effective uh, you know, uh, parasitoid uh, to reduce the populations? So this is, these things just take time. I mean, it does have some pressure, uh, these parasitoids to work as a good suppression in Asia. But even then, they still have the insect, and so you're not going to eradicate them. I think we're, we're going to have to live with this insect for a long, long time. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. And I see the time is really already getting late. Uh, you know, Barry, I wonder if I even should talk about this because there's not that many ash trees remaining. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm just curious. Maybe we have a two-part conversation here, Barry. What... Yeah, I, well, I, I lost a few yeah. minutes when I had the brown out, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I think um, we'll have you back to, to talk about this. I could real briefly, and I have to skip forward. Yeah, okay. Before, but, give, uh, give, us, give us a tease. Yeah, I wanted to uh, kind of go into something that, uh, where is my advancer here? Make sure I get this right. No. Okay, let's move along. Yeah, look at the. The, all the, the death and destruction of these fraxinus trees. Uh, this is my neighborhood, by the way. <laughs> and so uh, look at that, they're gone. They're yeah. gone. They're gone. <laughs> it really creates quite a, a change. And uh, are there some of our uh, fraxinus that are resistant to the AB emerald ash borer? Yes, there are. Well, one is in Asia. That's the Manchurian ash, <laughs> native to Asia. It co-evolved with, you know, the uh, the emerald ash borer, and so that has a pretty strong resistance against it. What type of resistance? It could well be that wound paradigm, that same thing that keeps the the native uh, birches uh, have a fighting chance. Now, also we have some in New, in uh, in our country, the blue ash. I tell you, I rarely see blue ash species, but they have a pretty moderate, or at least a partial. Uh, you know, re resistance about 65%. That's pretty good. Now, white ash down to 2%, slight. And the green ash is apparently zero, 
zero percent. So you have green ash, if you have them in your yard and they're not dead yet, and you're not protecting them, uh, they will eventually be killed. <laughs> Sorry about that. And it doesn't take them long. Uh, we usually four or five years after infestations, they're dead. I'm just showing you a Penn State to research uh, at a uh, residential community, how percentage of mortality as each year went by. And usually by the end of the fourth year, most are dead, which is the case uh, where I live. It's This is gonna be the fifth year. And there's about, uh, about 3% of them that are still alive, except for my three trees, which are living just fine. And uh, these are chemicals. And so I don't wanna go in that. Is it too late for future controls? Well, I think for most of our present day ash trees, yes, it's too late. Uh, and, but eventually, you know, we can certainly have some trees that are gonna survive. And perhaps one day we'll have some beneficial, uh, and they're working on this as far as biocontrols and parasitoid. That is a parasitoid there on an ash tree. Okay. So Steve, why don't we uh, put this on for another presentation? All right, uh, so I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, and I, as, the, as time has gone on, Barry, you know, in my early years, I've been with extension service for 28 years. You'd think I would have better discipline, but I get, <laughs> I get worse. Uh, in my early years, I could have got through, and in one hour, I could have got through 80 slides because I didn't <laughs> have much to say. Now I have maybe too much to say, and I, I take too long to say it. But uh, uh, it, it's all good. It's all good information. That's kind of a last slide I wanted to leave with. Uh, okay. you know, how do we know that biocontrol insects, uh, beneficial insects, are important? Well, about two percent of our insects in North America are exotic. And yet those exotic, those 2%, they represent about 50% of our major pest insects. And so that shows you how important that beneficial insects are and this ability to have that coevolution over many hundreds of thousands of years. And so when you bring in an evasive exotic, uh, things are not gonna change all that quick. As, and so it's hard to fight, fight them. So anyway, all right, so I, I think I better uh, take your advice and, and stop. And um, I don't know if there's any time for questions or not, uh, uh, but it is already pretty late. It was a 10 after eight, so. Yeah, so again, we will have you back, no doubt okay. about it, Steve. Okay. You, you so, sure you want me back, Barry? Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right. yeah, um, there's, there's no questions in the chat, boys, so you're free to sail. Okay, so we're going to take a break for a couple of weeks, um, just because everybody's busy this time of year. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be on June 7th, and it's Joe Magazzi from uh, Green Earth and Ag, one of our suppliers, and he, he's going to talk about, <clears throat> and it relates to what uh, Steve was saying about the, the neonex being taken off the board, and, you know, so what do you do? To effectively control grubs and and beetles, um, and the the product he will talk about is is a Bacillus thuringiensis strain that uh, only will kill grubs and and the, the adult beetles. So there's a really good option there to use. So, all right, if I can just real quick interject, uh, there there are other alternatives to the neonicotinoids, mm -hmm. and you know this is something that's been worked with by uh, you know, our within our industry now for a while, because I think a lot of us kind of anticipated this happening. And so, but there are some alternatives. And so it's not all gloom and doom for those who right. felt like they were overly uh, committed to the to the neonics because you have other choices. Yep, yep, absolutely. And I'll, I'll t I'm gonna talk to you more about that later on. <laughs> all right, th again, thank you everybody. Glad you joined on. Um, this has been recorded so you can always go to our website and. And I, I think 90% of them have been recorded. So it's it's a good way to go back and review and things like that. And and of course, take a look at our product list. We appreciate that. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank take you. care.